Welcome to the EMT Pro Podcast, where we deliver relevant EMS content from the field and the classroom each week. Each episode of this podcast can get you one full hour of CE through our partner, emt-ce.com. So head over there for more information. Awesome episode planned today, guys. As uh, always, I'm your host, Steve Williams. With me as usual, Dan and Holly. Guys, say hi. Well, hello, Steve. Hello, hello. So we're going to be talking to the EMS coordinator at Rialto Fire. His name is Joe Powell, and he's doing some really cool stuff. He and his department are doing some really cool stuff with uh, cardiac arrest response. And so we want to cool awesome. to see people going outside the box. Yeah, very wow. outside the box. You know, I love asking why are we doing it that way. Right. Mm-hmm. You know. Right. It's good stuff. Should we get him on the phone? Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Okay. Hello. Hey, is this Joe? This is Joe. Joe, this is Steve Williams. How are you doing, sir? Good, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. Hey, with me is Dan and Holly. And before we get started, we just wanted to say hi and thanks for taking the time to be on the show with us. We're really excited to have you on. Yeah, absolutely. Glad, glad to be on. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you just give us a brief introduction about who you are and how you got involved with this whole, you know, big change to cardiac arrest response? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, super, super honored to be here. So. Uh, good to be talking with you guys, and, and uh, hopefully we can get some information across that uh, that will help everybody move forward. Yeah. Um, so I'm the uh, I'm the EMS coordinator for the City of Rialto Fire. Uh, I'm, I've been running calls since I was uh, 15, so that puts me about 41 years in the field. And um, so I've been doing this a little while. Um, yeah. <laughs> we've uh, we've had some good good successes in Rialto. We've been published actually five times in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Uh, we've had a lot of good pilot programs, uh, you know, including this, this cardiac arrest survival program. But, you know, as you kind of asked, you know, how did we get started in this? A lot of people think that we took, <laughs> and we had this, we had this perfect setup. We, we sat down and we had this comprehensive look at our data and we looked over the data and said, here's where we're missing something. And then here is the, nice progression and the beautiful steps we're going to take. And we're going to go back and look at that data every three to six months. And we're going to make another step and we're going to, you know, double blind placebo control peer reviewed study. And, uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that's not at all how it, how it, you know, worked out. Actually, it was a very, uh, very clumsy, uh, you know, let's, let's try this. Uh, let's try this. Oh, that doesn't look bad. Let's, let's, let's look at this. Well, that doesn't work. Um, you know, process to get where we, we kind of ended up. And, you know, I, I say that's good and bad. It's probably good because there's a lot of departments out there that, you know, are, or, or agencies, whatever, whatever you want to call them, that they don't have the people to, to roll something like this out in a perfect, in a perfect fashion. And we surely didn't either. You know, we started out in 2009 when we picked up a, a mechanical CPR device, mm-hmm. the, uh, the auto pulse. And at that time, we had paper patient care reports, no QI coordinator. I was the entire EMS division. And the, the info for the auto pulse made sense. So we rolled it out. I mean, that's right. Okay. That's how we did it. We had no money, by the way. We're a relatively broke department. Okay. So we uh, literally rolled it out by hiding it in the least price of an ambulance. Uh, so nobody knew we were spending extra money. <laughs> Smart, and like we it. Bought, yeah, we bought auto pulses from uh, for, out of the uh, trunks of sales reps' cars. Oh, the like the used that, ones that they were. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah training every month, only. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it says training <laughs> on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's you know that's how we that's how we got them and and uh, and rolled it out and started using that process in, in 2009. So we started kind of making we thought we were making improvements stepwise improvements, but, you know, we, we surely didn't know until we went to a, a chronic patient care record. Um, and until we brought uh, Kevin Beard and our QI coordinator in, these are looking at the data, mm-hmm. right? So <laughs> from there, we kind of like, all right, we're cool, right? Because we think we're cool, right? Um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we all do. Our, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Our, uh, our ROS percentage has got to be really high, right? And, and we'll talk, you know, throughout this about ROS and, Surely, neurological attack survival is our goal, not Ross, mm-hmm. right? Correct. Um, but I, I guarantee, if you're not getting the Ross, your neuro- neurological attack survival numbers are poor, right? Correct. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One goes with the other, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, you got to get Ross before you get to your Ross and Ajax rival. So <clears throat> our Ross numbers initially moved out of and they were like uh, uh, 23%. Right. Wow. Which is still, like, that's, like, yeah. that's with good, right? That's just the auto pulse. That was so, with the auto pulse. Know, we, that was with the auto pulse. We oh. thought, well, that's, that's good. That's good. It's not great, but it's good. We thought we were better than that, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're like, wow, what's going on? Why aren't we, why aren't we doing better? Right. So we take a look. We, we start looking at the data and we start looking at the, um, and going out, you know, and actually watching the calls, right? And we're like, what's, What's going on here? What's going on here? And it didn't take very long to figure out that we were using the auto pulse just like we were doing manual CPR, right? So you stop compressions to check the rhythm, and you stop compressions to check the pulse, and you stop compressions to innovate, and you stop compressions to, do, to move the patient, and you, you stop compressions all the time, right? Yep. And you're going backwards yeah, so on, be, on that pressure that you've built up. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. Can see the chart. In and my so, head. to be 100% honest with you, you know, uh, the auto pulse is absolutely worthless if you keep turning the damn thing off. Mm -hmm, <laughs> True. Right. right. So it defeats the purpose. So we had, yeah, it does, right? When we get the great machine that will do perfect compressions, perfect recoil, right? No, you know, 100% compression fraction, and well, you don't turn it off, then we were turning it off all the time. You know, so we had to go back culturally and say, hey, don't turn the auto pulse off, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing trumps compressions. Nothing, right? Nothing should trump compressions. Correct. And when you go back and look at it and say. You know, and I, and I would ask you, you know, Steve, Dan, Holly, what, what should Trump compressions? Um, maybe Nothing. safety before you even get to the call. Not much. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you safety every day of the week, right? Somebody shooting at you, should yeah. Trump compressions. Yeah. But not, not but that I, I can really consider. Else. Yeah. But, but we don't do medicine like that. No. no. Right. We, we do medicine. We, we, everything trumps compression. Right. Airway trumps compressions, ID trumps compressions, drugs trump compressions, uh, checking a rhythm, checking a pulse, everything trumps compressions. But we know that doesn't patient. work. Yeah, moving yeah. the patient. Mm -hmm. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. So, so we, you know, that, that's, that's kind of how we started. You know, we started off with that process, started off looking at the, at the iron pulse and, and start off going, oh, well, we're turning the damn thing off all the time. So mm -hmm. that's not going to work. Yeah. So, so can I ask you a quick question just for some background, sir? So yeah. two, 2009, uh, what was your staffing level? How many people responded to a cardiac arrest? So same as it is now. We were we were running uh, two people on an ambulance and okay. three people on a, on a, a fire engine. Okay. Did you have first response from uh, public safety? Oh, uh, so we are we are public safety. Right? No, I meant uh, uh, you, you mean, police. Law, law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. We did, okay. uh, and still do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, and then we have paramedics on the engine and paramedics on the ambulance. So. Okay, sounds good. I right, continue on. I'm sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, you know, I think we, yeah, that's kind of how we got, we kind of got started. We started looking at it. So, you know, we said, Hey, we, we got to do something different than what we're doing. Uh, we got to not, not turn off the, uh, the, uh, the auto pulse device. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I'm maybe going backwards here, but you know, when you look at, at the effectiveness of manual compressions, um, <clears throat> it's terrible. Right. Yeah, it's good I, I for like two minutes. <laughs> we're, we're all we're all doing manual compressions very poorly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we we even define good quality CPR. If you look at the the NIH Prime Ed study or Prime study, whatever you say that, um, the eight thousand patients, right? And they define acceptable quality CPR as the compression rate of you know a hundred a minute, give or give or uh, take twenty percent. A depth of five centimeters to retake twenty percent, and a compression fraction of over fifty percent. That's how they define acceptable quality CPR. Wow. Now I'm no genius. Yeah. Fifty percent. But if you're great. off the chest, yeah, if you're off the chest fifty percent of the time in a thirty minute code, how, how much time are you off the chest? Yeah, fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes, right? Yeah. If I if I put you on an ECMO machine, right, and I said, hey, by the way, turn that thing off. Half of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you must have run calls with me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, nobody's going to live through that process, right? Mm -hmm. And we're like, why is our why are our numbers so poor? Why why is survivability less than ten percent? Right. By the way, anytime you're doing anything that you're failing, and ninety percent of your patients are dying, you should you should look at it. Right. Okay. I don't know how to say that. I didn't even include the cuss word. Right. You should look at it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So you guys right. implemented, you, 
you guys implemented this right. based on what you were already doing in 2009. So you were using the auto pulse exactly the way you were doing CPR and compressions and you were like, right. this doesn't work. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. How did you not, get not your, working. how did you get your crews to be on board with this and, and affect the change needed? Well, so my crews do exactly what I say first time. Oh, so, man. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good for you, Joe. Can you, can you parent my child, please? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, the, so that's, I, I would have to say that it's probably one of the most difficult things that uh, that we have to, to move forward with is um, is the cultural change, right? That we're going to do things differently. We're going to change the way we do things. Um, any number of things, right? So on top of using a CPR device, on top of not turning it off when, you know, when to check a rhythm or check a pulse or to innovate or any of that stuff, you know, we, we use a gurney as a, as a tool to sit patients up mm -hmm. and to innovate them, right? We innovate them on a, on a gurney and we're kind of going all over the place, but you know, I know we've spent our entire life, you know, on our bellies in a pool of vomit exactly. on the floor, but we, so why don't we put them on a gurney? You know, how many, how many anesthesiologists do you see on the floor of the OR <laughs> innovating a patient, right? Good point. So, and they have way better yeah, music so we, than we do. That's true. That's true. So, so we put them on a gurney, set them up, right? Get all that stuff out of the way. Innovation is much easier. But, you know, that was a change, right? And, and my guys were like, no way. As soon as we put them on the gurney, the family's going to say, you, you guys are in the hospital, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and I'm like, no, that's not true. Just, just talk to the family, mm -hmm. right? We'll get there. Talk to the family. And then <clears throat> we instituted staying on scene for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that if you have an income CO2 over 15, you've got to stay on scene for 30 minutes. Um, and we can talk about that. That's quite an interesting uh, journey there. But, you know, same thing. Culturally, they're like, no way. No way. Right? Well, yeah, because you've got 50% 50, 50 of your medics. And this is me pulling a percentage completely out of my butt. But it seems like there's two schools of thought on paramedicine. It's stay and play or load and go. And right. you're asking you know, whatever percentage of, you know, load and goes that you have a uh, style of paramedic at your department is nope. You got to hang out for 30 minutes. Right. I can imagine that's a big change for them. It is. It is it's a big change for them. They're like, what are we going to do? I'm like, monitor everything. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. <laughs> and monitor what's going on with the patient. Yep. The, the bottom line is we started seeing, we started seeing uh loss from assistance somewhere around 20, 25 minutes into the code. And, and wow. clearly that was, that was around 15 minutes of continuous compression. Mm -hmm. So if you stop compressions at any point, you get to restart that 15 minute clock, right? right. Because you got to, you got to be continuous compressions right. for 15 minutes or so before we're going to give it any chance of seeing Ross. But that being said, that's, that's how it kind of ended up going. Well, what, what do I do with that? Cause 20, 25 minutes in, we're getting Ross. And when we take them to the hospital, they're turning everything off. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, and the other thing, and I, I'm not in the when friends and influence people kind of business for sure, but when you look at it, you say, well, am I? What, let me ask you this: Who's got a better Ross grade, my fire department or the hospital? Right, right. Yeah, your fire department. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My fire department by about double. Mm -hmm. Right. So tell me why I would. And we know when we move patients. We decrease compression fraction. We decrease the ability to monitor them. We tend to pull out tubes. We do all kinds of stuff, right? So why would I decrease the level of care I'm providing, take my guys, code three, risk their life and my citizen lives to take them someplace that has half the Ross grade? Right. right? Okay. Good point. Why would I do that? Right? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to stay right here, right now, and do the care, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of how we got in the, in the stay and play you know, 30 minute realm. Mm -hmm. And we also, you know, as you look at that, we ended up in a situation where, you know, my medics would call the base hospital and the base hospital would say, okay, get her out. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I got to do what the base hospital says. So we eventually, because I'm a genius, decided we would not call the base hospital until we were out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Makes sense. Right. Yeah. Problem solved. Uh, so Joe, yeah, you, you, go. you said something that kind of, piqued my interest. You said this was a clumsy process. It obviously wasn't something that you sat down and planned out to the T. Um, yeah. But the thing that I kept thinking about was how cool is it that you had a group of people who were willing to work towards a common goal, even if it was a messy process, you know, or a journey getting there. And so 
I don't know who your people are, but the fact that you guys were committed to a common goal is, I think, probably the biggest hurdle because you have to define that goal and then, you know, and get everyone. You don't have board. to, know, yeah, right. and you don't have to know the steps, but you can absolutely, you know, know that you're trying to go towards something that everybody sees as a good thing. Yeah, I, I think you know because we see ourselves as a, as a progressive department, that helps, right? Mm-hmm. We say, look, we got to do a better job of, of this. Um, that's definitely beneficial, but. Again, um, there's nobody in my department except for brand new guys that haven't seen cardiac arrest survival at least seven times. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right? Wow. So, I mean, we go over it and we teach it, and then you go in the field and go, hey, didn't we talk about this? <laughs> right. right. And then you go over it, you teach it, and you go out in the field, and you're like, hey, remember we talked about this, right? And, you know, and they're like, you really want me to do that? Like, I do. I want you to not stop the other pulse, <laughs> right? That's I want you to not innovate not. with the other pulse going, right? You know? And so it, it's, it, it takes a long time to change that culture. Um, and you know, even when you train them and teach them, they're out in the field thinking that, that you meant something different. Mm-hmm. So it takes a lot of follow up, it takes a lot of work, and you know, good guys trying to do good work. Joe, when I am looking at the PDF that Rialto Fire has put out called the Wheel of Survival, I see that there's ten steps in a circular pattern on this thing, kind of like a, a typical ACLS algorithm, and it starts with manual CPR performed by the seat assignment, which I'm assuming you guys break out uh, roles for your cardiac arrest response? Yes, correct. Okay. And then it says after manual CPR is going, the CPR is continued with the uh, Zoll stat pads, and that includes CPR feedback, right, with the puck? Right, right. Okay. And, and feedback, and I don't know if I want to stop you in the middle here or, or not, but uh, yeah. you know, a couple of things important like in that step is is that we're going anterior posterior on the pads. Yeah, and I, um, I, I, I've seen that. Um, can you explain, like, is it just purely to get it out of the way so that it's not on the chest band device? Yeah, so it does two things for us, right? It, it allows us to see, see through CPR a little better. Um, it's not beautiful, but it, it lets me get that pad out of the way of the band. So see through CPR is a little clearer for my guys. And the efficacy of defibrillation is, is much improved when you go anterior posterior which is what the, all the manufacturer's recommendations are for the anterior or posterior. We've just got so used to doing anterior anterior because it's easier. Right. That the manufacturers have, you know, the, the pictures on the front of the package are anterior anterior, right? You know, exactly. And, and yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, sh- we, sh- we should be doing that. Okay. And don't let me forget at some point to talk about, you know, the acceptable pauses of yes. CPR. Or, yes, absolutely. I've got go those ahead. on here as well. Um, so then after that third step is BLS airway management. So you've got, uh, rescue pod, BVM, and capnography on there. Right, right. So yeah, so real early on, we get the rescue pod in place, and we can we can talk about that. Um, yeah, can you can you explain what a rescue pod is and why it's beneficial? Yeah, it's it's a little hard to just uh, explain totally what a not what a rescue pod is, but it, it the bottom line is, is it's a device that goes on the end of a airway device mm-hmm. that that allows for a negative interthoracic pressure, right? So when it, it just restricts the air coming back, uh, coming back into the tube, right? And so there's a, there's a small negative pressure created inside the, the interthoracic cavity, right? So mm-hmm. negative interthoracic pressure. And you're like, well, why would I want that, right? <clears throat> well, I want that for a couple of reasons. Remember, this is the blood in, blood out process. We as paramedics tend to look at this. I just need to get blood to the organ, right? To the brain. Mm-hmm. Well, no. You, you got to fight against ICP. ICP is always your enemy in, in cardiac arrest. Anytime you do a compression, you're spiking ICP. So we have to get blood out of the brain and we have to get blood back to the heart, right? So in that process, if we create a negative interthoracic pressure on the chest, it draws blood out of the brain, hypoxic acidotic blood, draws it out of the brain, decreases intracranial pressure, fills the heart better, and gets better cerebral perfusion. So we're getting oxygenated, normal pH blood back to the brain. And so it's that blood in, blood out, right? You got to think about it much, you know, much like uh, a closed, you know, in a closed loop system, you got to get the, that bad blood out to get your blood in. And so a rescue pod helps us decrease ICP, increase cerebral perfusion mm-hmm. by getting that negative interthoracic pressure. We're really in that pressure regulation program, right? We're in the pressure regulation business here. Right. Regulating pressure in the chest, regulating pressure in the brain, right? How are we regulating that pressure? We've got, we've got to look at ICP and we've got to solve ICP. If we're going to solve this horrendous Ross rate, this horrendous neurologically intact survival rate, 
we got to solve for ICP to some extent. Mm-hmm. Awesome. How come? How come this is not standard of care? Because honestly, I haven't heard about this in years. Um, so, so this is it's relatively simple. Why this isn't standard of care? So, I believe it was the uh, NIH Prime study that uh, happened uh, maybe maybe ten years ago. I, I have to look it up to be sure. But um, and in that study, it showed that the rescue pod had no benefit uh, to patients in cardiac arrest. And so, okay, you know, that, that, that study had eight, over 8,000 patients in it. When you go back and look at the study, when you look at compression fractions in the study, if the patient had a compression fraction rate of over 50%, it over doubled neurologically attack survival. If they had a compression fraction rate of under 50%, it actually hurt their survival. So we took that big study and not the sub-analysis and said it doesn't work. You go back and look at the sub-analysis, so, and that's an important point. You should never use the rescue pod if you're doing crappy CPR. It'll hurt your patient. Good, good to know. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, the bottom line. So if you can't do high quality CPR, your compression fractions aren't up in the 80% range or higher. And that's not uh, a statistical analysis for me. But if they're not, if you don't have high compression fraction rates, you shouldn't be using the rescue pod. Uh, awesome. You know, that's absolutely right. Because we, when we were part of the st- A study, that's when we were not doing mm-hmm. high performance CPR. We were... Mm-hmm. You know, doing it, stopping, going to get a coffee, coming back, started CPR again, and, and maybe <laughs> yeah. So now, now I get yeah. it. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So that was step three. Step four is deploying the auto pulse or a you know automated CPR device to give yeah, continuous yeah, compressions. Real, real quick on step three, when you, when you talk about internal CO two, yes, we yes, use yes. internal CO two in a number of ways. To, to determine patient care, right? And some of the most controversial stuff is, you know, we don't defibrillate less than CO2 in a certain spot, right? Less than over 20. So that's why early on, we're using entitled CO2 to determine ventilatory rate. We're using entitled CO2 to determine if we're going to defibrillate or not, right? Some of those things. So that's why that's in step three. Awesome. Sorry, back to step four. No, you're good. And so um, continuous compressions with an automated CPR device. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, the bottom line is, is we are relatively ineffective at doing good manual compressions, right, right rate, depth, recoil. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have a device that will do it for us, will do it perfectly, will not get tired, will not get distracted, will not look at the, uh, you know, will not, uh, you know, have, have to interact with family and law enforcement and, and you know, three, three o'clock in the morning upside down in the car, whatever, whatever's going on, right, that, that distracts us. You know, we're thinking about, we got to do a call in. I got to draw drugs. I'm going to have to do an IO. I'm going to check the rhythm. I'm going to check the pulse. I wonder what everybody's thinking about me. I wonder if they think I'm doing good or bad, right? All that stuff. Mm-hmm. All that stuff comes into really crappy compression fractions, crappy recoil, um, poor rates. We know we're off all over the place. And so for us, we have, we have to use a mechanical CBR device to get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, as, as, you, as we talk about that, if we're doing manual compression and you're not using feedback, some type of real time, right now, right here, feedback on whether or not you're doing it right, you, you're, you're in huge trouble. Yeah. So we, I was in uh, uh, Indonesia speaking, I don't know, a year ago or so, and we did a study. We had a, a couple hundred people that we were working with. That, not a study. We, we, we put um, these are medical professionals. We put them in the corner of the room, 70 in fluorescent. One minute of CPR without feedback, and one minute of CPR with feedback. One minute, 70 fluorescent, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> without feedback, they were in the right rate and depth 13% of the time. 13? Yeah. One, three. One, wow. 13. Right. Right? Wow. And, and so I, I, I hate to say this, it doesn't you know, win me friends, but if, you have a, uh, if you're in the right rate and depth 13% of the time, you should call the coroner and go do something that's going to save lives. Right. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. right? I mean, go save the guy that's having an MI down the road because you're not going to save that guy. So when we when we take that those so same people and put a feedback device on real time right now feedback, that went to forty seven percent of the time. Wow! Right? So that tripled the proper rate and depth. Mm-hmm. So if you're, you, you have to be using feedback, absolutely. If, you, if you're going to do manual compression, feedback is an absolute one hundred percent must. There's just no way around it. Do you have a set amount of time before you apply the auto pulse? that you do manual CPR or is it just as as soon as you get there, you put it on? 
so we so we've actually changed just just in uh, January and December where we're using uh, a rescue pump. So a different story, kind of all together. But um, we so we call it the first two minutes, and so we don't. It's not really a set two minutes, but the first couple of minutes it takes to get the auto pulse set up. You know, our guys will get in. They'll get their hands on the chest. They'll get a bag belt mask with a rescue pod and then travel CO2 and hold that seal during compressions. It's really important to hold the seal during compressions, not during ventilation necessarily, during compression, which is a complete shift in, in culture. Right. Right. Yes. So I'm trying to get that auto pulse to work during the compressions. But that, that being said, um, they'll, they'll slide a, a feedback device under the palm and the other crew will get the auto pulse ready. That's about two minutes. Okay. And to be a hundred percent, transparent we have been terrible at it mm -hmm. that because we've done so much focus on autopulse my guys are just like that yeah, just get them on the autopulse just yeah right. yeah we'll get those compressions done let's get them on the autopulse right autopulse autopulse you know, obviously i love the autopulse but we had to go back and look at it and say okay we're we're horrendous the first two minutes mm -hmm. gotcha. how do we how do we fix this right how do we how do we get better at the first couple of minutes because everybody's focused on getting them on the autopulse mm -hmm. and so we've had to retrain and retrain and get that first two minutes better and better. And then actually we just recently rolled out the, uh, the rescue pump as kind of a new tool. And to be honest with you, a new shiny, uh, shiny thing that will help with that for the first couple of minutes. Cool. Awesome. And so let's see, that was step four. So the next step is it says heads up. Can you explain what that means? Yeah. So we will put our patients up in a, in a 30 degree angle, right? We'll set our CPR patients up. Um, okay, so you're moving funny, them to the cot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, after we, as soon as we get them on the auto pulse, right, we will move them onto the cot flat, and then we'll sit them up to the 30 degrees. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely. By the way, it looks, looks probably silly when you have your uh, your full arrest patient sitting up on a gurney. Right. And, uh, you, we, yeah. and we, we do ethnic oxygenation. Well, maybe we'll talk about it, but which means they've got a nasal cannula hanging out of their nose. They've got this long stack, you know, still from their endotracheal tube. They've got the rescue pod and it comes CO2 and a filter and then, you know, and then bag valve mask and they're sitting up and, you know, you wheel them into the hospital and then, you know, doctors and nurses are like, what are you people doing? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. What is this? So the, the, yeah. The, uh, the, the heads up CPR is, is just, and it's, by the way, heads up CPR is free, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, no cost to it. Um, it significantly decreases ICP increases cerebral perfusion mm -hmm. and increases uh, coronary perfusion. So same thing, but, but heads up CPR, one caveat is it's gotta be done with a, a rescue pod. So if you're not using a rescue pod, you shouldn't be doing heads up CPR. But with the rescue pod, we see significant improvement in cerebral perfusion and cardiac perfusion and ICP drops specifically. And that's because it's delivering blood at a better pressure to the brain, right? Versus just flat. Um, yeah, but it's also, right, remember we're talking blood in, blood out. Right. We have to get the blood out of the brain, right? And so mm -hmm. getting the blood out of the brain, we use we use a little bit of elevation, right? To yeah, our use some gravity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Using gravity to our benefit. So we drain more blood out of the brain. It gets more blood to the heart and we increase ICP in that process. If you go to pig lab and you do this you did it from the pig, right? You you put a, a bolt in their in their brain to measure ICP. Mm -hmm. And you lay them flat and do, do compressions and set them up and do compressions. And you can see a significant decrease in ICP in that process, along with an increase in cerebral perfusion. So. Cool. And then you touched on it. The next step is apneic oxygenation. What's, what's that and what's the, the thought process behind it? Yeah, so, so a couple of things there is, you know, when we started saying, look, we're not going to turn off the autopulse for anything, right? Nothing drops compressions, nothing. Well, and so we started saying that. We started seeing a decrease in our innovation success rates, right? All right. Mm -hmm. So, so what do we do about that? Well, I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to stop depression. Right? So mm -hmm. that's not an option, right? So how are we going to improve? Uh, how are we going to improve that process? We actually uh, went to, went to uh, Texas where they let us put an auto pulse on a cadaver, only place in the country that would let us do that. So we might have heard the cadaver. That's good. <laughs> um, so we, uh, yeah put an auto pulse on the cadaver and we played around with a, a number of good things, which is kind of where we, one of the ways we, we decided to start doing heads up CPR on a gurney, uh, heads up innovation on a gurney, sorry. Um, you know, cause that improved our, our rates, but we also, you know, know from some of the studies, some of the pink studies that, uh, with good mechanical CPR, 
that uh, that went without ventilation, the pig will remain saturated above eighty five percent for over two hours. So, so we so what we did is we just bought ourselves time, right? So how long? I can ask you guys how long do you have to innovate a patient? Six minutes, maybe. I mean, depending on if they're healthy, what their comorbidities are. Are you talking right. about during right. cardiac arrest? No, I'm saying? talking about when when you stop compressions oh. and you're oh. you're sticking the blade in their mouth. How long do you have to, to get the tube in? Oh, jeez. Oh, sorry. Um, I thought you meant how long do we have or how long do we take, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> you should have about okay, thirty seconds. Were, yeah. yeah, thirty seconds. Yeah, yeah. how long were you taught? Probably the better way to go, right? Thirty right. seconds. You're right. right. Yeah. 30 seconds to get the tube in or as long as you can hold your breath, if you remember that process, yeah, remember right? And you probably cool. are holding your breath. Yep. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so, so in Rialto, with the nasal cannula flowing 15 liters a minute, and yes, you can turn a cannula on at 15 liters, mm-hmm. um, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as long as we're looking at their saturations and their entitled CO2, um, then I don't care how long it takes, right? I don't care. Yeah, as long as you've got those two things going minutes, well. Right? So, See, but just don't stop compressions. Mm-hmm. To put the tube in, right? So you have and the so pulse ox on and entitled CO2, and that's what you're monitoring during intubation. Correct, correct. Okay. And we're having a hard time, to be, to be 100% transparent, getting good entitled CO2 numbers because we're not moving a lot of air right. Right, in, that pro- in that process. But we're looking at those numbers, making sure that we're okay, and they can take as long as they want to innovate. And so that's culturally, it's been a, a huge change. You know, it's been the slow down, take your time, take a breath, right? Let's get the tube in the first time, don't stop compressions. We're actually moving a certain amount of air. We actually, when we start looking at our data with the autopulse, we can see about 80 microventilations. Right? We're like, what are those little teeny microventilations at 80 perfectly, right? Mm-hmm. Now that's the autopulse, right? Yeah. The autopulse moving, that's moving the chest and ventilating. Mm-hmm. So we went to abnic oxygenation basically so that we could buy ourselves time and not stop compressions to get the tube in. So that kind of touches on innovation and capnography with the rescue pod as well. Um, the next step, this would be step eight, is the nasogastric tube. So gastric decompression and cardiac arrest has been around for a while. Mm-hmm. People have been doing right. that. Um, it actually was new to the department that I'm at uh, pretty recently. Um, but okay. I know that it's pretty common. Like I know, Dan and Holly, you guys use it mm-hmm. um, at the flight service you work at, right? And at the fire department. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And you guys have been doing it for a while? And in the hospital. Yeah. Standard. We're so behind. Well, I oh, mean, man. it's not 100%. I mean, there's <laughs> people who do and some people who don't. Okay. So it's been included. It's just not necessarily but adopted not, as much. It's not a protocol. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we've had it in our protocols, but we're going to stand. We're, we're trying to standardize it currently. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, this is one of those things. It's hard to change your practice, but yeah. we've got to get, we can do it better. Mm-hmm. We need to do it better. So Joe, can you, yeah, so, yeah, can you talk on that, the NG tubes? Yeah, so every cardiac arrest gets an NG tube, right? Mm-hmm. The bottom line is, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm spending good money on a rescue pod and sitting them heads up and doing everything I can to decrease interthoracic pressure, and they've got gastric detention that increases uh, inter, you know, interthoracic pressure yeah. and therefore increases ICP, then I'm just fighting myself, right? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we need it in a human so there's, there's no gastric detention, there's no increase in interthoracic pressure, and there's no ICP spike in that process. You can, if you go to pig lab and you have that ICP bolt in, right? You can push on the pig's stomach with your finger and watch ICP go up. Mm-hmm. Significant, right? Wow. A little bit of pressure on the stomach, ICP goes up. Take your finger away, it goes down. By the way, another thing that you have to be careful of is, you know, we'll take that cardiac monitor. First off, we take the cardiac monitor and we put it someplace the guy doing compression can't see it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I don't know. Because we're, I don't, I have no idea why we do it that way, but, and so, but, and so we have to put that cardiac monitor in front of the guy that's doing compressions with the feedback device so it's clear whether he's doing it well or not, right? So I don't know why we always kind of put it someplace that that guy can't see. But we also, you know, so when we started saying, hey, I don't want that cardiac monitor at the head of the gurney, right, under the person's head because you can see it. I want it on the, on the feet of the patient. People would put it on the, the hips of the patient. And so you put the cardiac monitor on the hips, it actually ends up on the belly. Yep. And it increases ICP and decreases interpressive pr- oh, wow. pressure, mm-hmm. right? So not, not on the belly. I want it on their ankles, right? It's got to be on the ankles. Somewhere down there. You put it on the belly, you're going to fry some brain cells. So just, just a thought. Of, I don't know where I was when we started that process. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. I, and I think, I think one of the coolest things that just doing some basic research on what you guys are doing is the fact that you guys are so dialed in to 
you know, monitoring the improvements or the, you know, the stuff that you want to change about the way you're responding on these calls, you're picking up those little, little things like that, that can actually have a, a pretty significant uh, difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's huge. I've yeah. heard of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We, we just got to be careful what we're doing. Right? We got to look at what we're doing. We've got to rethink or unlearn or whatever you want to say it, right? what we're doing and stuff. You know, we're, we're losing 90% of these patients. So we get, we're doing a ton of stuff wrong, but, and, and, and I'll be hundred percent honest with you when we get, we get done with this conversation. I'm going to tell you that probably 50 percent of what I've told you today is wrong. Right. <laughs> right. I just, I just, I just don't know which 50 percent yet. I will. <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> well, I love that you've incorporated a lot of the um, really good airway skills into your um, ROSC management or your CPR management, right. which is ramping the patient, pre-oxygenation, apneic oxygenation. Yep. Great seal on the BVM. Great seal on the BVM. And now you're really setting yourself up not only for great success with your CPR, but with your intubation that's right. coming up next. Yes. Yes. And I think, you know, as we talked about that, just as a, as a caveat, um, you know, we have to be really careful at ventilatory rates, Right. Right. I think when we look at when we look at all of the data and we when we look at real data on real calls and we look at video feedback from malls and parking lots and places that are filming cardiac arrests, we know that on average we're ventilating for patients somewhere in the forty range, Dang. in the forty range, right? Which is increasing wow. interthoracic pressure, right? Dead air mm -hmm. trapping in the lungs, all kinds of terrible stuff that we all know, and and so that's why we go back and look at internal CO two and saturation as how we ventilate. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, the book says what, 10 to 12 minutes, right? Right. right. We, should, we, we should burn the book, by the way. Just burn <laughs> the book. Um, Thank you. Right? Because the book says 10 to 12 a minute because it, cause it doesn't believe. <laughs> so it, the, the bottom line is mm -hmm. you should ventilate them based on end time CO2 and saturation, not at a 10 to 12 minute number. Right. And that's not taking into account how much volume you're putting in for each squeeze. Like Absolutely. I've got small hands, so maybe I'm only put in 400 mils, but yeah. the big guy next to me might put in 800. Mm -hmm. It's pretty high minute volume. Yeah. Thank you. I got some, I got some California firefighter guys, right? They got some guns going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And they, uh, they can, they can empty every inch of that bag into the patient's lungs <laughs> at, a, at a rate of, you know, 30, 40 a minute. Right. So. The burning multiple BVMs on a call. <laughs> <laughs> it's their workout for the day. And Joe, I might, yeah. I might butcher this uh, quote that I saw next to your name um, doing a Google search on you, but you had a slide up on one of a, pre, uh, a presentation that you gave and it said something along the lines of what you know is getting in the way of doing it right. Yeah, I think you know, we, I call, we initially called this presentation when we first started doing it, unlearning what you think you know about CPR, mm -hmm. right? Because you think that everything we're doing is the right way to do it. We think that early defibrillation is the right way to go and give epi and, you know, rhythm check, pulse check, stop, you know, hold CPR, rhythm check, pulse check, let's sit here for two minutes while we all admire the monitor, mm -hmm. right, and try to decide whether that's, you know, is that, is that a, is that a, you know, the trick the rhythm with a couple of premature beats or like, who cares? Can right? you print a strip so I, I can look at uh, it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the bottom line is, you know, who, who cares what the monitor says? I only want to know one thing when I look at the monitor and cardiac arrest, to be honest with you. But, so first off, if their end time CO2 isn't above 20, I don't look at the monitor. I don't care, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm not going to defibrillate under 20 and nothing on the monitor that the monitor is going to tell me it's going, to, it's going to tell me something I, I care about. So, and so explain I, why I you wouldn't explain for the listeners why you wouldn't defibrillate if your end title is under 20. Okay. So yeah, so this is where we probably get one of the, the largest pushbacks from, um, you know, we've had some uh, state medical directors that, that said they're going to file malpractice against departments that are, that institute this, this policy. But this, this, so, so let me ask you this. Um, why do we differently? What's the goal? Well, the goal is to shock a shockable heart, to put it back into a perfusing rhythm. Okay, so I would say number two, you're correct, and number one, you're not, right? Okay, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you say the goal is to shock a shockable heart, I wouldn't disagree with you. Mm -hmm. But I would, would agree with you that the goal is to, to change that patient into a perfusing rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. So... I'm with you halfway on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we don't do that, right? We just, you know, early defibrillation, early defibrillation, early defibrillation. That's mm -hmm. what we got to do. Regardless if it's going to be successful or not. We mm -hmm. don't care. We're just going to do the book that says, says defibrillate. <clears throat> so if you defibrillate an acidotic hypoxic heart 
and we've all done this. You just replace that guy. Anytime the CO2 is low, it's early in the code, you're not doing good compressions. You just replace a VDIV into a system, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And you never get them back. Happens all we've the all time. We've all done it. I've, I've done it tons of times in my career. And now they're so stable. Our, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> we, we stabilize them. Mm-hmm. So we don't want to do that, right? We want to, we want to change that rhythm into a fusible rhythm. So I want the heart to not be hypoxic. I want it to be well oxygenated, and I want the pH to be as correct as I can make it before I deliver electrical energy. And so when you look at, at our data, and there's some studies out there uh, out in Japan, um, I'd have to look uh, to give you the exact, the exact quote, but when you look at just our data in Rialto, and it's anecdotal, we don't run, you know, 10,000 calls, 10,000 per day for us a year. But when, when we look, go back and look at, when we defibrillated patients who had an internal CO2 of below 20, our ROSC rate was 9%, right? Nine. When we defibrillated patients with an internal CO2 over 20, our ROSC rate was 73%. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, hey, Joe, can, we're I, ask, compelling. can I ask how many yeah. cardiac arrests a year on average do you run? Yeah. So we, we have about 130 uh, people that are in arrest when we get to them. We work up about a hundred of them, a little less than a hundred of those every year. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, okay. So that was uh, the one. And, and, you know, let me, can, can I just say, and I'll, 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 uh, I'll, yeah, yeah. I, I just, it, we can't, we cannot continue to do medicine like this. Oh, we can't no. just defibrillate every, everybody because it's what it says in the book. Right. It's not getting us where we need to go. So we got to stop it. Right. And we've got to look at it and go back and say, we can't do medicine like this, right? We, I'm not going to pay you guys to do sh- paramedicine and defibrillate everybody because somewhere in some book it says that's what we should do. If it's right. getting you, 90% of your patients are dying. Mm-hmm. That makes sense? Totally. So, okay. Yeah, I love okay. it. I'll, I'll settle down, I promise. No, <laughs> don't settle down. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we're getting you fired up. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next step is placing an IV and medications as needed, which... Um, th- that one is so funny to me because it, it makes so much sense. But when I look back on every cardiac arrest call I've ever been on, there is one medic who jumps on the IV right, right off the bat. Like we need <laughs> right, that now, right now. Right Absolutely. now. And, you know, it's, I'll let you talk about it, but it, it's hilarious to me that, uh, you know, when you look at the way that we've divvied out the roles that need to be, um, given on a cardiac arrest that this is like, I got the IV, you know, like right. it's just one of those things that they're all gung ho to go do. Yeah. So and this is a, this is a significant cultural change again. Right. Mm-hmm. And we're still not perfect at it. Right. We're still, we're still working through it, but yeah, somebody wants to jump in and do the IV or IO, right. Get that done. Okay. So tell me what an IV or IO is going to do for your cardiac arrest patient. Right. What is the, tell me, tell me where the study shows that, that that's going to increase survivability, increase neurological attack survival, it's going to increase ROS rates. What's it going to do for you? Right. Well, well we have to, right? We have to. Well, so, I mean, <laughs> well, if you were to ask 90% of the people at my fire department that, they'd say, well, we need to give epi as soon as possible because that's right. what we're told to do. Oh, do you want to go down the epi road? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I think when you look at epinephrine, so we're relatively clear that epinephrine decreases cerebral, cerebral drainage, decreases cerebral perfusion, right? Um, and increases ICP. So there are, okay? are, are there, there's data behind that, correct? There is. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Right? And just so, so I can put and, this out there real quick, Joe, will you send some of these supportive documents so I can put them in the show notes so that people can refer to those um, sure, on the website? Absolutely. That'd be great. Yeah. So when you look at that, and so when you go to pig lab, Right, and you push epinephrine on the pig that's getting compressions, and they're they're you know we're, we're doing that whole process. Right, you can you can see the drainage goes down, you can see that cerebral perfusion goes down, ICP goes up, right? So that's that's relatively relatively clear. So when you look at the, there's just a recent study that that uh, got published out in the UK, um, over eight thousand folks in that study also, and they you know in the conclusions they clearly state that. Um, the use of epinephrine resulted in significantly higher 30 day survival than the use of placebo. All right. Good enough. I'm in epi early and often. 
right? Every three to five. Right. <laughs> sure. All day long. Right. Yeah, let's, let's empty that drug box. You know, these drugs yep. save lives. But the other, the other part of the conclusion is that the rate of favorable neurologic outcomes, uh, because, so I'm sorry, there was, a, there was no significance in, the, in the, the two groups because there was significant severe neurologic impairment in those survivors. Right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Oh, wait a minute. So there's neurolog neurologic impairment in the survivors. So I, okay, no epi. Nobody gets epi. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Crap. I don't know what to do. Right. Do you right. give epi or not give epi? Yep. And so I would kind of propose that there's probably a sweet spot here. Right. Sure. That is, that is, so uh, let, let me give you, I'm going to give you two scenarios and then you guys can answer and then we'll kind of go from there. But, if, if I gave you a caveat, if I said, if I said to you, look, your family member, your, your mother, your brother, your daughter, your, your, your wife, husband, whatever, your family member is in cardiac arrest, and I'm going to guarantee that you're going to get ROSC. Okay, here's the caveat. I'll guarantee you're going to get ROSC. You can choose if you want to give epi or not. Do you want to give epi? After you guarantee we're going to get ROSC? I guarantee you're going to get ROSC. No. Yeah, no, absolutely not, right? If we don't need because it, we don't want you don't want, it. Yeah, you don't want the neurologic impairment that, that, that comes with that, right? Right. So let me take it the other way. If I say you will not get ROSC on your family, your mother, your brother, your daughter, your wife, husband, whatever, you will not get ROSC without epi. Do you want it? Oh, boy. Every time. Every time, right? Yeah. Because those patients that don't get ROSC don't have very good neurologic probability, right? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so... So there's probably a sweet spot for epinephrine. There's probably some place, and there's probably some dosing regimens, um, maybe microdosing, maybe a drip. Uh, there might be some dosing regimens that might get us there better that don't affect uh, intracranial pressure and you know cerebral confusion as much. But I can tell you for sure when, when you don't want to give it. You don't want to give it when you're doing crappy CPR, your patient's laying flat, you don't have a rescue pod in place, you're overventilating them so they don't have a negative intracranial pressure. And then we, in the first two, three, four minutes, shove a bunch of epi in there, mm -hmm. increase ICP, decrease your perfusion, burn a billion brain cells. That's not when you want to give it. Is it safe to say right. that people are, you know, maybe they haven't actively thought about it this way, but they're giving epi to achieve some of the objectives that these other steps that you guys have are doing a much better job of? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. Yeah. I think that's true. But the reason you see our IV at the, the last part of our wheel of survival is, is we want to take that first 15 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. We want to optimize, uh, we want to optimize oxygenation. We want to optimize cerebral perfusion. We want to optimize cardiac perfusion. We want to optimize, uh, you know, the pH balance. We want that patient optimized. And if, if we've done all that and we don't have ROS back in 15, 20 minutes, whatever that number looks like, then maybe epi is a good alternative, mm -hmm. right? Because, because we've optimized everything else, it's going to have a much lesser effect on on ICP and the brain damage than it would have early on. So that's why you see it as one of the last things we do is start an IV. And to be honest with you, our local EMS agency, you know, says in their protocol that we have to give epi as soon as we establish the exact hmm. So that's you a nice see way that to we get around it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> we put venous access as the last thing, right? It's, it's the least it's one of the tools that has the least impact, uh, positive impact on survival. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put it at the end. And that also lets us delay epinephrine to a, to a place where we think it might be appropriate if we haven't gotten lost by it. And so Joe, I think this is kind of a, a cool thing just to touch on it for the listeners. You're, you have a fire-based EMS department or I'm sorry, EMS. Correct. Did I say that right? EMS based fire department, <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> that and the other thing, but you also work with a private ambulance in your district, correct? Um, so, so no, we, we provide all of the transport, um, okay. within the city. We okay. do get some mutual aid from, uh, from AMR when we're out of ambulances, but 98% of our calls, if not more, um, are run by our, our, uh, our ambulance service. Okay. The fire department. Okay. Service. Good to know. We run a, we run a, a single function paramedic and EMT on the ambulances. And then a dual bunch of medic uh, firefighter on the engine. Awesome. And then, the, Joe, the last step is transport decision based on end title, and then that includes your post-ROSC care. 
Yeah. So, so remember that we're looking at if the end time of CO2 is over 15, then we're going to stay on scene for 30 minutes. So, um, that's why that transportation decision is based on our entitled CO2. Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll be staying on scene for 30 minutes and then we'll get route, but we'll only get route if those, if those patients have, have an entitled CO2 of over 15 and trending up. We'll actually use entitled CO2 to help us determine whether we're going to, we're going to determine death, right? Mm -hmm. If, if entitled CO2 is below 15 trending downwards, as long as with one caveat, and we, we messed it up by the way, but as long as the tube's in the right hole, Right, right, right. right. <laughs> we, we've, we've done it, right? This is, I think this is important. Is some of the realities of, of making significant change is that you're going to move focus to a different location and you're going to make some mistakes on that focus, right? So we're focused on end tidal CO2, end tidal CO2, end tidal CO2, and that number's dropping. And my guys are trying to bag on that number, right? They're like, wait right. a minute, it's going down. I need to slow down my bagging. I need to rent. How's this working? What's going on? Um, and we've had those guys take that patient to the hospital with the tube in the wrong hole. Right, because they're focused on what we're trying to accomplish. Right, and to be honest with you, nobody in my department has ever gotten in trouble for cardiac survivability. Our, our, you know, our motto is "Let's be better tomorrow." Let's be better tomorrow. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we screwed that up. Let's look at it, and we'll be better tomorrow. That's awesome. I like that. Yep, I love that. Um, so, one of the things that I know is out there that I think we should briefly touch on. I know we could probably talk about it for an hour, but is the Utstein criteria. And I know that it's a little bit controversial because it's pretty limiting, but it's also that one stat that departments love to either keep to themselves or market very heavily. <laughs> so what's, what's your thought on that? Good or bad? And, you know, what and, can we and do? what to, is it? If you could explain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what it is. Well, so, so what is, I'm sorry, what is, what is our estimate rate or what is estimate? Um. Well, Dan kind of threw that question in the last uh, second there. I'm Maybe, sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> no let's, uh, let, let's define it first and then, or, you know, talk about what it is first and then um, what you guys yeah. do with it. Yeah, so you have to, you know, to, 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 for a patient to be included in HUSB criteria, they have to be in a witness cardiac arrest. They have to uh, be in a shockable rhythm, have CPR, uh, you know, CPR done prior to arrival. Right, those are the three criteria witness cardiac arrest, CPR prior to arrival, and being a shockable rhythm. So those are the patients, because we have defined those patients as those are the only patients that are survival, right? Nobody survives asystole. Um, by the way, we're, we're, we're working around a 40% uh, asystole rate, uh, ROSC rate. But um, so the, we define that because nobody survives asystole, so we want to exclude all those patients. Mm -hmm. And nobody survives not getting depression prior to arrival or, or being a witness. We want to exclude all those patients. And so we're going to use this HUD criteria to be inclusive, right? To include just those patients that meet those that criteria. Correct. Which is cool, right? It's a good way to kind of have a common measuring foundation, right? That sure. being said, less than 10% of our patients meet that criteria. Right. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's go back. And, and I'll, I'll tout us all day long, right? I'll go, say, oh, us is great because I'll put it on the front page of the newspaper. Our last time we measured us we were at 86%. Yeah. Right, eighty six percent. You want me to go tell everybody how cool we are? Eighty six percent. But yeah. but that's that's eighty percent, six percent of the ten percent, right? Right. I still got a bunch of my patients dying. I got to do something about the assistance. Mm -hmm. I got to do something about the people that had depression prior to arrival, right? I got to do something about the patients that weren't witnessed. I got to work on those patients. I got to work on them longer. We have got to do more work. You know, when we first started saying that you're you're going to stay on team for thirty minutes. Our asystole ROSC rate was 23%. Asystole, right? Mm -hmm. And we said, you're going to stay on scene for 30 minutes. We went to 41% ROSC rate for asystole. Wow. When so, you stayed on scene? When we stayed on scene for 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, That's absolutely. Awesome. So, um, yeah, we had, to, we had to look at that and say, hmm, okay, how do we save all of our patients? Regardless of whether they had CPR prior arrival, regardless if they had compression, regardless if they're a shockable rhythm or not, I, 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 I have citizens. I got a hundred thousand citizens that I'm going to save, and they don't care what the us criteria is. They only care whether they're right, whether their grandpa or husband or wife or child survived cardiac arrest, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's what we're you know that's what we're paid to do. We're paid to fix those people or do the best we possibly can. And so we got to look at the whole criteria. I, I you know I. I've seen it, I've seen it, and, and those numbers can be, uh, 
good. We just can't rely on that unless you're okay with ruling out nitrogen in your cardiac arrest. Right. right. I love that. But, yeah, we're not. So very cool. Um, and then, so that's that's your wheel of survival. But one of the things that you touched on, um, kind of in the beginning, that you wanted to go back over was the focus on minimizing pauses because nothing trumps compressions. And so, uh, okay. um, if I have this correctly, I see four things you guys focus on, but let's go over the, the areas that you have that you've identified that are, they're going to require a pause and then the allowed amount of seconds for that pause. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we, we have defined in writing and policy what our four acceptable pauses of CPR are. Are, are. That's bad English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, and, and so you know, we, com- we commonly say that if you don't define in writing what your acceptable pauses of CPR are, you'll have more pauses than are acceptable. Right? Every yeah, time. Right. Like so it. you guys define it in writing. We know that this, that pausing causes a decrease in survival, but we don't really want to write it down or make it a policy, right? We're just going to, hey, don't pause much. So yeah, we've, just we've written it. down in policy what those acceptable pauses are outside of safety, right? Again, if somebody's shooting at you, you know, that, that's all that's sure. wrong. But so, um, and if you look at the, these four things we're going to talk about, these four things I get something for. I buy something for every pause. If you're going to pause, you better buy something for the patient. You know what I mean? Right? Sure. So, well, we're like, so number one is place a feedback device. So, you know, we get there, we start compressions. We take what we use, uh, the Zoll X-Series, and we use the puck for a feedback device. And so, you know, my guys will literally lift their palms up and back on the chest and start, start with that feedback device. It takes about a second pause to do that. And so for that second, what do I get? Remember we talked earlier that I can triple compression pressure. Yeah, right. 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 right? I, can, I can triple the effectiveness of, of, cardiac, uh, of CPR if I just have a feedback device. So I'm going to buy for that one second. I'm going to buy tripling of, of the effectiveness of CPR. So I'm in, right? Mm-hmm. So we'll pause for a second to do that. That's number one. So two is to place a posterior pad. We talked a little bit about that earlier, right? The reason we go anterior, posterior, better effectiveness of the fibrillation, and it gets better, a clearer vision of the underlying rhythm when we're doing compressions. Um, so I'll place I'll place a, a posterior pad. It takes me about five seconds to do. Hit the patient up, slap that pad on the back, lay the patient down. Mm-hmm. Now my guys actually have integrated that into placing the auto pulse on. <laughs> to some extent, right? So right, you lift them up to place the device, put the pad on, yeah. put them back down on the device. Okay, right, right. Um, but what do I get for that? I get I get a, a better effective fibrillation for that. I get a better view for that. I don't have to stop compressions as, as much to, to look at that, right? So I have a better view. I have better fibrillation by putting that pad there. It's gonna cost me five seconds. Will I take that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. and, and by the way, let me, let me go off on a quick, quick tangent. Sure, we love tangents. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when, when we look at the cardiac monitor, right, and, and by the way, if, if I haven't said this to be 100% transparent, I have done everything wrong in cardiac arrest since I started. I've never actually run a call right, right, when I look at the way we should run a call. Hmm. You know, I haven't been out running calls in the field for 15 years, and I've done everything wrong, so I'm not, I'm not bagging on anybody, but... When you, when you stop, when you do a pulse check, rhythm check, right? This is how we normally, this is how you do it in the real world. Right. Go, okay, we need to check, right? Everybody stops. Somebody checks, grabs the wrist. You look at the monitor, right? Stop CPR, and then you have this whole conversation, right? right. Every time, right? <laughs> you know, man, is that an idiot of particular rhythm? Is that a PAC or a PJC or that, what is that? I don't know. Hey, right? Dan, and come feel have, this. I think I feel something. <laughs> <laughs> right, come over, right. Dan, come over hey, here. Well, yeah. is, that, is that atrial or is that ventricular? I'm not sure. Right? right. And really, we only care about one thing. Is it B fib or is it not? Right. And right. And again, we only really care about that if the end time of CO2 for us is over 20, because we're only going to over 20. But that being the case, so, so now in my department, if we're going to look at them, if we, if we can't see the underlying rhythm very well, right? We're looking at it, but I'm not sure if that's B fib or not. The end time of CO2 is over 20. <sighs> I'm not sure what that is, right? For whatever reason, the, the image isn't great. So how do we, how do we check a rhythm? Right. So now we say, okay, guys, we're going to have to prepare to check the rhythm. So some of you are ready to pause the autopulse, push print on the monitor, ready, pause the autopulse, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, start the autopulse, turn print off on the monitor, take the strip out, the paper, 
and everybody can pass it around and have a discussion about what it looks like because compressions are going on. Right? Cool. So yeah. okay. that two second pause. If you, if you have the chest, you, you check the paper. Don't check the monitor. One, one thousand, two, one thousand back on the chest. And we'll look at the paper. And if you guys want to admire the paper, have a little popcorn, you know, and, uh, and have that whole thing. That's, that's cool. But calipers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> wow. That's a long time ago. Um, so I'm sorry about the tangent, but if you're going to check a rhythm, right, you should check it with a two second pause, not with a two minute pause, which is how we all do it. You know? That's a great yeah. idea. So, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So I'm sorry. Back to the four pauses yeah. of, of CPR. So that was, that was number two, right? Number two was place a posterior defibrillation pad, mm -hmm. about five seconds maximum, but I'm buying yep. something for that. Right. Um, number three there is place a mechanical CPR device. Right. Uh, in five seconds, right? Yep. And so everybody will say to me everywhere I go, oh, come on, Joe. You can't put an auto pulse off on in five seconds, right? You can't put a Lucas device on in five seconds. You can't do it. It's not possible. It takes longer than that. Don't, don't lie to us. It only takes five seconds. And I will always tell them, no, 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 you're, you're answering or asking the wrong question. Right. The question is how long it takes to put the device on. The question is how long are you off the chest? Correct. To put the device on. The actual pause in be, the CPR. Yeah. Yeah. So we can be off the chest for five seconds, right? That's our maximum allowable with the pulse on. We actually sit the patient up, slide the auto pulse on, lay the patient back down. And we have a guy come in from the right, uh, the right side of the patient, the right shoulder area and start compressions over the right shoulder while they're working on putting the strap together and getting the auto pulse going, mm -hmm. right? So that our pause is five seconds. So not putting the auto pulse on isn't five seconds, but the pause is five seconds to put that device on. And will I, will I spend five seconds? Will I, will I purchase something for five seconds? I will because using a mechanical CPR device that has 100% compression fraction, that has the right rate, the right depth, and the right recoil, right? That's, that's, that's huge. That's, yeah, that's where I want to be, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'll spend five seconds for that patient, you know, off the chest line to buy place and mechanical CPR device. So we can do that you know, all day long. And so the, and the last of the four pauses is starting the mechanical device. Mm -hmm. So the mechanical device, and, and maybe the folks in the will kill me because I don't know the proper terms and everything, but there's a, a load dis distributing band yep. on the back of the auto pulse, you know, right? Um, and if you're touching or pushing the pushing on the patient or moving the patient, they can't properly measure the size of the chest, and it will err. So those two seconds, I got I got to have, right? I got it for those two seconds. You can't touch the patient, and then the band's got a size to get to get everything straightened around before it starts compressions. And so we'll also spend those two seconds um, to to get that mechanical CPR device doing perfect compressions on that size patient. So sure. those are the, the go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, Joe, I'm gonna save you. I think they called a life band. Oh. The, the load so distributing a, band. I think Zoll calls it a oh, life band. Okay, okay. So you're yeah, back you're, in their good graces right. now. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah. The, uh, whatever the sensor is, or the black sensor on the back of the, on the uh, front of the auto pulse that goes in the back of the patient that that uh, that senses the size of the patient and the weight and all that stuff and measures it, you know, mm -hmm. to make to make compressions you know perfect. And so that's got to be you can't touch the patient when that when that's sizing otherwise. Can you get trouble. Can you get most patients in the life band? Most like big ones or little ones and such, because I know Lucas, we yes. have some problems with that. So, so we've had patients up to almost 400 pounds. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure there's a parameter that Zoll says weight wise, um, right. but um, but they also say as long as the patient will fit. Because we've had some larger patients on there, but we have had patients that are too large for the for the audible, no question. Okay. Which is another another caveat that you got to kind of look at is that since we have a mechanical CPR device. We aren't that good at manual compressions when we actually right. have to do them, mm -hmm. right? right? And so, so we, yeah, that's that's something you got to work on and say, hey, you're going to have to work on this because we're going to have those patients that don't fit on the auto pulse, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to be better at the, at the at manual compressions. So, and so then you're just working a code like the rest of us work a code to some extent, yes, right? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Like the common man. Yeah, the common <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, that was really all I had for the episode today, but, um, how can people get a hold of you if they want to chat about this stuff, maybe for their own department, or if they have some questions that, you know, they're trying to implement something and they want to run it by you, or I'm sure you're a busy guy, but, um, is there a way to get a hold of you if they had a question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're, uh, my boss says we're out to save the world and he seems to be proving that 
Nice. <laughs> but uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can always get a hold of me at uh, J Powell. That's the letter J, P O W E L L at Confire C O N F I R E dot org. J Powell at Confire dot org. You can shoot me an email and say, hey, you're interested, or uh, you know, if you have any questions or, or concerns, or if there's any way we can help you uh, save save more people, uh, then then we're definitely in. Awesome, awesome. And I guess you know to kind of finish things up a little bit, where, where do you want to see this whole thing go? Cause I, you know, if, if I'm getting this correct, this is a constantly changing and evolving process for you. You guys aren't st- sold that this is, you know, the way to do it for, you know, the end of time. So where do you guys see this thing kind of moving to next? And what are some things that you want to see happen in the industry to maybe supplement that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, like, like I said earlier, I think, you know, probably 50% of what we're, what we're doing now is wrong. We just don't know what's 50%. We've got to, we've got to continue to look at that. We've got to get, we've got to gather more data. We have to have more, more agencies, more departments, right? More doctors, nurses, hospitals, paramedics, firefighters, right? We need them on board doing this and getting the data so that we can, we can see what, what's working and not working. Um, you know, we're doing a couple of things differently. Um, at this moment, we rolled out, we rolled out the rescue pump. Which is a uh, um, a, a pump that that uh, does compressions, but also pulls up on the chest, right? So you get an active compression, decompression, mm-hmm. um, to improve cerebral perfusion, right? So it, it aids in getting that negative interthoracic pressure. So we just rolled out that uh, the the rescue pump in uh, in late December, early January, to help improve the first few minutes, and and actually we're doing that for six minutes before we put the auto bolt on, but um, and and. Very anecdotally, we see a, a fairly significant rise in our neurology and tax survival uh, wow. across the board. So, but uh, but that being said, we've, we've only been doing that since late December, and COVID came along in March, and you know we've all been COVID focused uh, ever since. Yes. So, um, yes. man, we haven't had a good chance to look at those numbers. So we've done that. We were we're also uh, doing a, a, a trial study on uh, regional oximetry or RSOT, frontal lobe oximetry. Where, uh, so we're putting a, basically a, a, a pulse oximeter type device on the forehead of the patient, right? Frontal lobe of the brain as far as away from the heart you can get. And are we perfusing the brain or not? Is heads up helping perfuse the brain? Is epi perfusing or not perfusing the brain? Is an ITE working? Is, what's our, what's our respiratory rate? What are we, what are we bagging those patients at? And what does that number look like? And so we're just, we're, I mean, we, we've had it for a little while, but we're just, because it's not really used in the field, we're, we're trying to figure out what good and bad is, right? And we're, we're very early on in that process, but I think it's going to be able to tell us where we are with, with frontal lobe oxygenation, right? What's working there and what's not working. And which one of these seven tools that we use is, is working the best and which one's not working and what, how do they work in conjunction, right? Cool. So that um, awesome. I think that's, that's going, to be, it's going to be exciting. I think long-term, um, not, I think long-term, I know long-term here's, here's, here's my goal. And I have said this in every lecture I've done in the last year and a half is, you know, so we have, we have a moonshot for 2030 with our advanced cardiac resuscitation or our ACR program. So that, that moonshot for 2030 is that we get to 50.1% neurologically intact survival somewhere, some agency, some country, I don't care, somewhere. We have an agency that's at 50.1% neurologically tax survival by 2030. That's wow. our goal, and we're going we're gonna to get there. That's we can awesome. get there. I need people, though. I need people. I need their data. I need to know what's working and not working, what works for them in the field, which is why we do all this stuff, which is why we talk about it. We say, look, right? because you're going to look at something eventually and go, hey, Joe, you know, you've been, you've been, you've been, uh, can I say smoking dope? I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Hey, man, we're in Oregon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, there you go. <laughs> um, you've been smoking dope, right? And and this uh, this ITD or this you know delayed defibrillation or whatever doesn't work. This works, right? And I'll, okay, right? Because I'm 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 in the forest and I might not see the you know the forest from the trees. And you know I need other people to say, hey, this is working and not working. This is what our data shows. Um, and so we can get there. We can get to the moonshot at 50.1% by 2030, but I just need other people involved. I need other data. And, sure. and the other thing, to, uh, not to not a caveat, is I think the importance of this, the program and, and what's been developed, you know, in Rialto and the, the Advanced uh, Cardiac Resuscitation Program is that 
we've proven that it's reproducible. So we have um, we have plenty of departments that have taken it over. Some, you know, some namely uh, Lawrence from Kansas, Naperville, Illinois. I remember that right. Um, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they said, "Look, we're going to do what you tell us to do. We just come in. We're going to bring everybody in on overtime. We're going to do what you tell us to do. Just tell us what to do." And we have right. And their numbers are fantastic, awesome. right? Their their neurology test survival numbers, their ROS numbers. Um, so they the the process. You know, the magic about McDonald's isn't that it, they can make a burger or fries. The magic is that it's reproducible, mm-hmm. right? Right. Same thing here, right? If we couldn't reproduce any of the stuff we're doing in Rialto at any other department, then it's cool, but it's not that great. But if it's reproducible, and we've proven it is. Then, then it's then it's really exciting. We can reproduce this, and then take the next step, and then the next step. And by twenty thirty, we're going to be at fifty point one percent neurology test survival somewhere. That's so rad. I know where I'm moving to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> retiring <laughs> Rialto. Retire <laughs> <to> Rialto. <laughs> well, Joe, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show and for sharing what you guys are doing. Um, it's inspiring. It's it's really fun stuff to learn about, and I kind of geek out on the frontal lobe stuff that just seems yeah that's awesome so exciting to hear you you've been a medic or you've been a firefighter for 40 something years and you are so passionate about changing your practice and that's really inspiring and still knowing that you're still 50 percent wrong and willing to change (laughs) that that just amazes me Mm -hmm. yeah yeah we have to be open to that right we really have to right we have to work at being open right because our egos get in the way right we're not now we're right we're right and mm-hmm. we have to work at being, being really open to maybe we're not right. Or just so accepting the fact that us. this is how we've always done it. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Stuck in that rut. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I think anything, you know, I don't think there's probably, there's probably nothing uh, in, in EMS that we have a, a poorer, uh, poorer outcome. And maybe traumatic cardiac arrest, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe traumatic cardiac arrest. That's the only thing we have a worse outcome than cardiac arrest. But I mean, and so people will go, hey, Joe, you know, you guys are really sharp. You took this over and, did all these things. I'm like, no, we're not that sharp. It's low hanging fruit, right? Mm-hmm. 90% of my patients are dying. I can't really hurt them. Right. <laughs> right. So we, we got to move it forward. Right. It's yeah. low hanging fruit. I didn't take something that's got an 87% survival and, you know, fixed it by 5%. I took something that's terrible and, and made some big changes. And that's, that's relatively simple. So Awesome. Well, again, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, if you want to reach out to Joe, his uh, contact information is going to be in the show notes. And uh, just one more time, Joe, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Uh, You got it. Yeah, it's an honor to be on. I appreciate it.